Welcome back to Element 14. My name's Phil, and today I'm going to show you how I make my own cave surveying tool. So, back in the 1990s, I went on a caving expedition to Austria, and at the time, we were exploring new caves, and we used to use these old mechanical analog compasses, inclinometers, and just a very low-tech reel of surveying uh, tape measure, like a ginormous tape measure, which was like up to 30 meters long. So one of the problems was that you'd have to pick a site so that you could get the furthest distance you could go in the cave, so you could not have to do as many readings. Um, but that often meant that the points you were measuring from were like, quite low down or in a puddle or just somewhere really nasty. And to use the compass, you had to get your ha head right next to it. The, the other problem was you needed light on it. So you could use your, the light on your helmet, but that the light itself has a magnetic field, which interferes with the compass. So you need to take the light off your helmet and hold it a little way away from the compass. And all in all, it was just an absolute pain in the bum. So after I'd been on a few expeditions, being a bit of a nerd, I thought, ah, oh, there's got to be a better way of doing this. So I looked into it. I found some magnetic sensors, some accelerometers, which will measure which way gravity is. And I worked out I could do a lot better with this and use a laser as well. So today I'm going to show you a bit about how my designs have evolved over the years. And I'll also take you through some detail of how my current design works using some uh, quite modular off the shelf components. And then we'll go on the caving trip and we'll uh, see how well it works. This is the very first version of the Shetland Attack Pony that I made. Bit of an odd name. I was in the uh, pub one night with some caving friends and we tried to f make up the most memorable name that we could. And Shetland Attack Pony won, which, uh, yep, everyone remembers that name now. So this is the first version. So you can see we've got a little alphanumeric. It's just a little dot matrix LED display here. There's a very flimsy button on the side, and this is the laser pointer. And on this version, it's literally just a pointer. So it doesn't do any distance measurement at all. So with this version, you had to have a tape measure as well. This was an off the shelf case. It was not waterproof. It was a bit flimsy, um, but it worked. People played with it and they found it really quite useful. After a few years, I got some competitors and they had a laser rangefinder, so I needed to redesign everything. It's still quite hard to find off the shelf laser rangefinder modules which work in the visible spectrum. There's lots of infrared ones out there, but to actually find a visible one is quite a challenge. So eventually I did find this one here. You can see it through the case. And you'll notice the case is now transparent, so I don't need to cut a window in it so that you can see what you're doing. We've got a much more ruggedized button here, and I've gone for a nice OLED display here, which means it's much easier to display the information for your end user. This is all quite tightly packed together, so actually assembling this was a bit of a pain. So after a while, I moved on to a 3D printed case. So this still has all the same components inside it. It's just a bit more spaced out. And in fact, it's actually the same circuit board underneath. Now I'll show you what the current version looks like. So let's have a look at the uh, circuit diagram that I've created. So there's a few interesting parts on here. First of all, we've got a microprocessor. So I've gone for a Seed Zhao NRF52840 Sense. This is really quite a nice little bit of kit. It's got an NRF52840 processor as its core, which gives you um, built-in Bluetooth, but it's also got built into it an accelerometer, which I need, and a microphone which I don't need, but that's okay. It's also got a charger for a LiPo battery built into it as well, which is really handy. The other bits I've got, so around here, we've got the RM3100. This is really quite a nice little magnetometer. It uses what's called magnetoinductive technology. So you've got three coils all at 90 degrees to each other, and you put an electrical field, electric current at fairly high frequency alternating through each field using it kind of like an oscillator 
but the speed at which they can oscillate is affected by the magnetic field going through each of those coils. So you measure how fast the oscillations go and you can work out what the magnetic field is. Kind of cool. So other bits and pieces, we've got a 3.3 volt regulator to provide power from the battery. Um, for all the other bits and pieces, I deliberately gone for one which actually is possible to enable it. So you can shut off power from the battery to all the other sensors and the display and etc without um, turning off the power to the main microprocessor. Uh, it just makes life a little bit easier. Uh, as it turns out, I'm using a quite a big chunky LiPo battery and the charger that's built into the Zhao would have taken forever to charge it. So we've actually got another LiPo charger built in as well. And other bits and pieces, we've got, this is just a link to a header for a connection to the laser module. So a Gizmos now do a really quite nice laser module. It's got 100 meters range. We've got a link to another header which connects to a couple of buttons. Yeah, two buttons now, not just one. And we've got a header for the battery to connect to. Um, so just four pin header, which allows you to plug in one of those nice little OLED displays and a buzzer. And that's about it. There's a couple of little gotchas when you're laying out the circuit board. So I needed to have the Zhao at one end because that's where the USB connector goes. And I kind of needed to have a battery at the other end uh, for space concerns. I want to keep all the high power stuff as far away as I can from the magnetometer because as you know, electric fields generate magnetic fields. And let's just have a look at the other side. And you can see I've actually done a cutout in my ground plane underneath where the magnetometer goes. Uh, this is so we don't get any electric currents coming back to the battery through the ground plane right next to the magnetometer because that will interfere with the readings. And that's about it really. We've got the connectors for display here, nice big chunky battery connector and a couple of tiny little connectors for the laser module and the buttons. Do you like free stuff? You can join the Road Test program. You can get free dev kits, test equipment, and even online training courses. In exchange for a detailed review, join our Road Test program. Learn more at the link below. Ah, free stuff? Now it's time to do the final assembly. I've got here the 3D printed shell and I've got a little bezel and I've uh, glued a bit of acrylic in here so you can see the display for it. It's got a couple of holes here for the uh, buttons. So first step, we've got the circuit board, we've got the laser module on the side here and I've glued the battery onto the top. That will go in in a minute. First, I need to put the buttons in. With the buttons, we're going to put a little bit of silicon grease on the top, and these will fit into this bit here. Then we take our circuit board with the buttons on, and we'll pop our lead on there. That goes into there. Finally, we've got a little shim which just holds everything in place so that can just fit in there like so and just a firm push and that's in place next we want to connect up the buttons to the main pcb there we go that's in right and we're gonna slowly slide that in there the whole lot just goes in make sure this wire here stays up there and it doesn't get in the way and we can just push everything in so we're going to use again a bit of silicon grease just to help keep any water out caves can be extremely wet and muddy and generally just not very friendly to electronics so we want to try and protect our device as much as we can there we go so i got a nice little sheet of silicon which i've laser cut into just the right shape to match this that goes on there and another layer of grease 
don't need to be too accurate with that because when you put the lid on it all gets smudged into here. So to be able to screw these in, I've used what's called heat certs. So these little brass threaded pieces of metal, which you can push into 3D printed items with the soldering iron and they melt the way in and then they stick in really firmly and they are fantastic for doing this kind of work. And they grow really, really well. Right, and that's it, that's connected. And we just take this end, get a cap, Inside, there's another little bit of uh, silicon which has been greased up, and that just screws onto this 3D printed thread. Like so, that's it, and it's ready to go. Hey, it works. And ooh, you can see the laser on my hand. Turn it off. One of the things I really love about this project is that it's really open source. The previous versions of my project, the very first one, I used an 8-bit PIC chip, and that needed a specialist IDE, specialist compiler, and actually setting the tool chain up to produce the code was quite challenging. Um, everything was written in C as well, which is not the most user-friendly of languages. After that, I moved on to the second version, had a 32-bit um, microchip in it, and that was an improvement. It meant that I could do some of the calibration routines on the actual device itself, rather than needing to connect to a separate computer to do the calibration routine. Um, but it was still not very adaptable, so if somebody else wanted a new feature to it, they really needed to ask me to do that, and I didn't really have time necessarily to do all that. This latest version, I'm using some really lovely new bits of kit. So there's the Zhao NRF52840 Sense module, which is the main module on the board. So it's got lovely castellated holes at the edges so you can solder it on flat onto the board but it's also really easy to solder. The board I've designed quite chunkily so it's easy for someone to mill or etch their own board and then it's fairly straightforward to solder the, the various bits and bobs on because they've all got quite big um, pads and finally the microchip itself runs CircuitPython so that means you plug it into a laptop and it shows up as a disk drive. And on there are all the files that it runs with. And it's Python, so it's really easy to edit. So in fact, with this new version, I've had a few people sending in pull requests to me, which is brilliant because now they're doing the coding for me and I don't need to think about it so much. And the thing I really like about this is I'm making it so that individuals can make their own devices, they can adapt it, they can modify it. And because everything's pretty modular in it, it's fairly easy to swap out, say you can't get hold of a particular laser anymore. Well, you just get a different laser range finder and you can use that instead and all you need to do is write the code for that laser rangefinder, everything else just works around it. With your own projects, have you made any special considerations to make them adaptable by other people? And have you kind of tried to make it more democratized, like more available to the general public? And what do you think about open source as a philosophy for making not just software, but hardware as well? One last thing. Before we go outside, it's important to remember that any iron around is going to interfere with the compass. So when I was first doing this, I tried to do all my calibration while wearing a lovely big chunky metal watch and it just completely ruined all the calibration. Even the batteries and what looked like a fairly plasticky kind of watch can throw the calibration off. So make sure you're not wearing any big chunky metal watches this ring is pl um, palladium, so it's fine. Um, but also big chunky belt buckles can interfere with the compass as well. Let's go and test it out. So we're going to measure over to that wall just over there. Take a reading. There it goes. And that is 1.81 meters. Um, this is a plastic drain pipe, by the way. So we'll just do that, and then my beautiful assistant can measure 
And if you look carefully, you'll see that is 1.81 meters there. There we go. That's numbers, 1.81 meters. And let's go caving. And here we are. I've got my pony connected via Bluetooth to my phone and we're using an app called uh, Sexy Topo. I'm going to move from one place in the cave to another and I'm going to record legs in between each one. As I go, the pony will download those to my phone and it will start creating the bare bones of a map for me, just a line, we call it a center line in caving. Now that I've finished getting my basic center line, I'm going to draw in some of the features. Now, this is gonna look a bit rough and ready. Um, often when you're underground, it's muddy, it's cold, it's not going to be very pretty, but I'm just sketching in the basic features. So I've got the walls of the cave, I've got a little side passage off down to the right, and I've got the openings at either end of the this short tunnel. Once it's finished and I've got home, we can update this and make this a lot more pretty, like this one, which someone else has done. That's my pony. It's been a labor of love for the last 15, 18 years. I can't really remember. It's been a long, long time. Um, do let me know if you've got any comments or questions about it, either below or on the Element 14 website. See you later. Bye.